It is because while there are differences, there are also stark similarities. It is in the spirit of this similarity that I have the greatest pleasure and distinction here this afternoon to welcome most warmly and most passionately Ustad Adnan Rashid, a visitor from the UK, as well as Pastor Rudolf Bosov of the South African Theological Seminary, to engage us this afternoon on the origin of the New Testament canon. Our moderator this afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, is Mr. Shabuddin Rumane, who will give us a more detailed introduction to both the speakers as well as the topic of engagement this afternoon. I once again thank you for coming, welcome you, and ask you to sit back and enjoy what promises to be a most absorbing, enlightening, and illuminating debate. With these few words, I hand you over to our moderator, Mr. Shabunin Romani. Thank you. Thank you. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. And uh, good afternoon uh, to everyone. Uh, the nature of debates of this uh, type can get quite fiery at times, people. So um, uh, let's um, observe very basic rules uh, for the event. Uh, the uh, just basic house rules, for example, please put your phones in silent. It can be very, very irritating when uh, the phone rings when uh, whilst the speakers are speaking. So, s phones in silent, please. And then also, uh, we're going to have uh, Q and A towards the end. Uh, can I ask that we observe what we call the three S rules: short, sharp and succinct questions. So if you've got uh, kind of preconceived ideas of the types of questions based on the topic that we're going to be discussing today, and please, if you have questions, make sure that the questions are relevant. Both speakers are kind of multifarious peoples. They, they can talk on topics very, very, very vast. So let's stick to the, the topic for today if you do have questions. So short, sharp, and when I say short, I'm not talking about my height, people. Um, short, sharp, and succinct. Make it clear so that we can give each and every one the opportunity to say what they, they want to say. So on my right, you have a brother, Ustad Adnan Rashid, who hails from the UK, and uh, he is a prolific speaker, and uh, in my engagements with him thus far, uh, he uh, is a virtual encyclopedia when it comes to historical facts. And those of us who've uh, uh, maybe been on YouTube, you would have uh, perhaps um, uh, understood the, the, the kind of content that sits in the mind of Adnan Rashid. I'm not as fortunate, though, with, with Rudolf Bosov uh, to have known and met him in the past for me to, to, to comment about uh, his knowledge. And I'm sure it's very deep particularly within the field that we're going to be discussing today. So the topic today is very simple. It's on our big screen here. Uh, it's, it's, it's a topic that, that uh, has been, I think, over time uh, discussed quite often. Uh, but we, we might be able to give you a different perspective uh, on, on uh, the, the content of the topic. So in terms of procedure, uh, Pastor Rudolph will start off with a 20-minute opening statement. And then we will have uh, Brother Ustad uh, um, Adnan Rashid for 20 minutes. We'll have a rebuttal for 15 minutes from uh, Pastor Rudolf, and then equally 15 minutes on this side for Adnan Rashid. Then we come to Q&A, and then we're going to have five minutes of closing statements. And then, obviously, if you want to, you can engage them if there's time uh, immediately after that. Is that fair? All right, so we'll start immediately with uh, Pastor Rudolf. Mike is yours. I'm, I've got a clock. I will, make, I will start the time. And it starts right now. Testing. Can you guys hear me? Well, just before we start, um, before you start my time, uh, two days ago, I lost a 
we lost a very dear friend. Um, Abu Bakr Aku died in a horrifying accident. Uh, and he, we used to debate in the past. And I just felt before we start with this discussion, sure. just before we start with this discussion to be remind, just mindful of him and his family. Uh, and also for the debate world in South Africa. I think overall, uh, we're definitely going to miss him. Uh, and as a friend, I appreciated him. He appreciated our discussions in the past. And I just wanted to, before we start, um, for the sake of his family and also his memory, uh, just say, really thinking about him and we will really miss him. Uh, just wanted to do that before we start. Thanks. You can start my time. I'll also start my... Thanks. Well, the topic of discussion today is something that is quite dear to Muslims and Christians. And the reason for it is very simply that we all believe in one form or another that God has spoken. And this is very important. And a lot of times I hear the conversation going between our two communities and I find that we sometimes miss each other because we speak about peripheral issues that does not really address the heart of where we are unified. And what I wanted to do today is uh, to, to speak a little bit about how we can find a commonality and look at what our respective communities uh, basically say about revelation, uh, what they believe about what God has said, what God has spoken about. And then what I want to do is, is I just want to look at uh, the canon, its historicity, the New Testament, its formulation, uh, what it means when we look at canon from a Christian perspective, the way in the history of the church we, we find the canon coming to its full written form. Uh, all of these issues are some things that, that we need to look at and we need to discuss. So my friend Dr. James White says the following, and I want to repeat these words. He says, the canon is not just a fact of history, but an artifact of revelation. Now, what does that mean? Well, it means exactly what I've just said. It means that we all believe in our different respective communities that God has spoken. It does not matter if you're a Muslim, if you're a Jew, or if you're a Christian. You believe that God at one stage uh, of this world's history spoke in different dispensations and in different times. Now, again, when we come to Christianity, we've got a very different understanding of what it means when we look at the authorship of the New Testament or the Scriptures. So when we look at the Scriptures, we dearly believe that the author of Hebrews speaks and he says God has spoken in various means and in a variety of ways. And so when we look at the New Testament, when we look at the compilation of the 27 books that are placed in the New Testament, we recognize that these books have certain qualities within them which allow for us to discern that God has authoritatively spoken. So it's important also just to say that God spoke through human agency. Uh, and there are varied authors that speak from varied backgrounds. But the point is simply this. It is important to know that we are not saying that the New Testament merely contains the Word of God, but Christians believe that it has become the Word of God. Uh, liberal contentions will tell us otherwise. Liberal contentions will tell communities like ours that believe that God has spoken that we should not hold the two assumptions together that God can speak and man can speak together and what is found in its fulfillment and efficacy is known as revelation. But it is, and that is the claim that Christians make. The New Testament Scripture has therefore, in the Christian estimation, both a human and divine quality. We believe it's totally human, but we also believe it is totally divine and an expression from God. So throughout the New Testament, you'll hear words like from men, from God, and sometimes it will speak quite succinctly and clearly and repeat the words that God has spoken through this human agency. Uh, Peter in 2 Peter 1.21 says the following though. He says, men spoke from God as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit or the inspiration of God. So we can see quite clearly that God has spoken through unique personalities and different backgrounds, different understandings and different purposes for the sake of what he wanted to communicate. And so when we look at the two contentions of human agency and divine agency, when it comes to the overall understanding of what it means when we speak about Christian revelation, we basically say that our theology allows for the assumption that God can speak authoritatively and he can relate to us fully through human agency and he can still grant us the understanding to know what he has said. In other words, we are saying that we need to realize that God communicated perfectly as to what he wanted to say to human agents throughout history. Now, the question we need to ask that we sometimes do not reflect on, especially when we look at the New Testament, is what happened to that which was spoken from God? 
Now, there's a lot that I need to get into, but I'm going to just give you a brief summary of where we got the New Testament. Uh, Dr. Tasker, professor of New Testament exegesis at the University of London, remarks and he gives us a glimpse. He tells us the following. He says, there were at least 35 years of Christian teaching and Christian missionary activity before the believers were in a position uh, where they had written records of Christ's life and teaching. Uh, and also what we know as what we assume to be the four gospel. Uh, he adds the following though. He says, our faith today is bound to the condition and conditioned by the four gospels. But we need to understand that the faith of the earliest Christian communities were independent of these written records. What is he saying? Well, F.F. F. Bruce states the following. He says, Jesus wrote no book. He taught by word of mouth and personal example. But some of his followers taught in writings as, uh, as well as orally. And indeed, their writings was a second best substitute for the spoken word. And this is very important. Michael J. Kruger uh, says when he considers the literacy and the orality of the earliest Christian communities, he says, for the average believer in the first century, the content of the Christian writing, particularly about books or the Old Testament and the New Testament, was only heard. In other words, they were not opposed to texts, but majority of times, the way in which the word of God and the words of Jesus were transmitted were through verbal or oral teaching. He then goes on to say the following. He says, the Christian message or the evangelion was by word of mouth. Now, why am I saying this? Well, Graham Stanton uh, writes about the oral proclamation that spilled over into a literary form. Uh, and he says, one of the most surprising developments of the Christian use of the word gospel, for instance, is that we can see a trajectory of the word evangelion, which used to be a Christian compilation or proclamation. And therefore, the, the, the oral proclamation in later centuries, especially he reckons from about 160 by, with Justin Martyr, uh, refers to the Evangelion or the gospel as something which now have become something that is in written form. So there is no disparity between the oral gospel and that which was written and sustained by the Christian community. Now, for the sequence of how the Old Testament themes were solidified in the New Testament scriptures, I will not go through that for the sake of time, but I will say that Stanley Portier uh, and a few others, Richard B. Hayes and uh, uh, Jane Scroter and Alan Kirk and Tom Thatcher and Richard Balcom have given sufficient evidence to tell us and to make us believe that the oral formae community that the first Christian community found themselves in were actually very strong. And in the oral proclamation, they actually rendered the words of Christ quite accurately. Okay, so the New, Te New Testament authors had this as a background before the actual written text was given. But what happened to the New Testament understanding uh, and the earliest Christian community's understanding of the New Testament? Well, uh, we can turn to the Scriptures itself and we can see that uh, Christ, for instance, uh, especially confirmed the all of the Old Testament. Uh, he starts off, uh, and uh, we can see quite clearly in Luke chapter 24, verse 44, he says, In the law of Moses and the prophets and the Psalms, all of these points towards me. Uh, he also speaks quite clearly about the preservation of the Old Testament in Matthew chapter 5, 18. And he tells us that one jot uh, and one tittle shall not pass from this law until it all is accomplished. Uh, and so to the Jews, he also plainly says in John 10, 35, that whatever is written in the scriptures cannot be broken. So Christ affirms the veracity of the Old Testament text. But what about the words he gave to the apostles in the New Testament? Well, in Mark's gospel account, he affirms the very fact that his words is preserved. We can see in Mark chapter 13, verse 31, he says, heaven and earth shall pass away, but my words will remain. And then there's another promise in John 14, verse 26, where he speaks quite clearly. And he says, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, will teach you all things and remind you, speaking to his actual disciples, everything I've said to you. Please note that Jesus claims unambiguously that he is the central message of the sweep of the Old Testament and that the Old Testament would be sufficient uh, for the uh, existing of the New Testament community and the understanding of his mission and his person. Now, this is very important because when we look at the earliest Christian fathers and the earliest Christian community and the way in which they assumed this canonicity of the 27 book uh, New Testament, we can see that they assumed immediately by recognizing internally that there is something special about these books. Uh, Lee Martin MacDonald writes uh, about the inspiration and the emergence of the Christian scriptures. And he says, the first and most important authority in the early church was Christ himself. 
Whatever Jesus said and did, in a real sense, that was the canon, the final authority, and that also for his followers. He goes even as far as to say that when we look at the dependency that we have today on the Christian scriptures, we need to understand that this was quite foreign in the first community. We can see that there's rather an emergence of an oral formaic tradition, which then gives life to the written text. Well, so what happens to the very words that Jesus spoke? Well, we can just see that the promise is made. Jesus speaks quite clearly, and he allows for us to understand and to know that his sheep will hear his voice, and that is proclaimed in John chapter 10, 27. So what does it mean? Well, Michael Kruger tells us, he says, well, when we look at the authority of the New Testament, it is not only an assumption made by later creeds or councils or by the church, it's rather a self-authenticating canon, and this canon gives itself the authority because it is speaking authoritatively from God. Uh, The reformer Hermann Bavink, uh, in actual fact, speaks in a very similar manner. And he says, in the church fathers and the scholastics, Scripture rested in itself. It was trustworthy in itself as the primary norm for the church and theology. Uh, In other words, what he is saying is, is that Scripture's authority with respect to itself depends on Scripture. So, why is this important? Well, it's important because anything and everything that it reveals about what we attune ourselves to, when we read the 27 uh, 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 book New Testament, it, is, it tells us that there's a divine quality in it. There's a providential exposure to the first Christian community. The attributes of canonicity arises and the divine qualities and the corporate reception of those qualities has its hands and has its origins in the apostolic origins. So, We've got that, and then we also have the promise of Christ about the internal testimony of the Holy Spirit. But I want to ask you the following. What about Islam? What is the Quranic perspective on the New Testament? Now, this might shock you, but it shouldn't. It's a Muslim community. You should know this. But in Surah chapter 3, that's just in Al-Imran, it says the following. Allah will teach them, that is Jesus, the book of wisdom, the Torah, and the gospel. So uh, this is succinct of what we read in John 7, 16, when Jesus says, and Jesus told them, my message is not my own. It comes from God who sent me. So in Surah Al-Maidah, chapter 5, 40, uh, 46, it says, and in the prophet's footsteps, we see Jesus, the son of Mary, confirming the Torah, as we see uh, Jesus speaking about the Old Testament, sent before him, and the gospel, therein is guidance and light. Now, I know that a lot of people like to pick these verses and say, no, it's rather uh, maybe the recorded instruction or anything else. But the more we delve and read into Quran, the more we see that the Quran's estimation of the New Testament is very positive. Very, very positive. Uh, And we can see this as well uh, when we look in actual fact a little bit earlier. Uh, We can see quite clearly uh, that there's the, uh, in Surah Al-Maidah, uh, chapter 547, we can see that Christians are even called, let the people of the book, the, the Al-Kitab, judge by what Allah has revealed therein. So if the people of the gospel are to judge by what God has revealed in the gospel, then how can the gospel they are to be judged by not be the gospel God told them to judge by? No, it is. And Allah has made it clear that that book is secure. Uh, also in Ayat 48, let me just add and say that it says, To the people of the book, we send the scripture in truth, uh, confirming the scripture that came before it, and guarding it in safety. We can go on and on and on and show that that's what Jesus said in John 8, 32 and John 17, verse 17. He says, The truth shall set you free. And in the same vein, he says, The words that I've spoken to you is spirit and it is truth. So what can we say? Well, we can authoritatively say that we, we look at the Quran. The Quran never says anywhere that the Bible was corrupted in the way some people assume. The Quranic commentator Fazlur Rahman says that the Quran says some people of the book, some hypocrites, according to Surah Al Maidah 5, 61 and 63, uh, have perverted what they heard, but there's never a textual corruption or an affirmation of manuscripts being changed. These are the words of a Muslim scholar. So where does it leave us? Where does it leave us with approximation when we look specifically at the New Testament? Well, when we look at the Quran, when we look at the New Testament, we can see quite clearly, unambiguously, that the Quran, as well as Jesus, as well as the Old Testament veracity, shows us quite clearly that we can esteem the New Testament as we have it. So what's God's perspective on 
his word. Well, just to give you a glimpse, in Psalm 19, in uh, the writings of David, uh, in verse 7 to 11, he tells us that the, the law of the Lord is perfect, refreshing the soul. The statutes of the Lord is trustworthy. It's right. It's radiant. It's pure. It's firm. It's, it's in actual fact, uh, also a warner of those that adhere and listen to it. So what does it mean? Well, the prophet Isaiah in Isaiah 40, verse 8, once more, tells us that the word of God endures f- forever. Uh, King David in his Psalm 119, 89 says, Your word, O Lord, is eternal. It stands firm in heaven forever. And fascinatingly, when we look at the Quran, there are two surahs that testify that the reality of Allah's words are sure. In Surah Al-Nam, chapter 6, verse 114 and 115, we can see quite clearly that the word of thy Lord uh, do thee find its fulfillment in truth and in justice. Thank you. None can of thy Lord's stuff find its fulfillment in truth and in justice. None can change his word. For he is the one who heareth and knoweth all. In Surah Al-Kaf, that's chapter 18, 27, says something very similar. It says, and recite and teach what have been revealed to thee the book of, from the book of the Lord. None can change his word, and none will find it uh, other than as a reference than him. So, we can see quite clearly that in the Quran, in the New Testament, in the Old Testament, the assumption is made, the words of Jesus Christ, the words of the Quran, that we can look at the New Testament, and number one, we can find it to be authentically given. Uh, when Jesus speaks in Matthew chapter 5, 21 and John 9, 39, he says, you heard it said, but I say to you, it also repeats the words, and Jesus said, which tells us that there's a form of authenticity in what is given as the teaching of Christ. But secondly, it's not just the authenticity, it's also biblically, like I said before, when we look at the promise of the New Testament, it's none different. Then what Muslims receive when they hear and read the Quran, telling them that their scriptures are preserved. Very same promise in the New Testament. Remind you of the words of Jesus in Mark 13, 31. Heaven and earth shall pass away, but my words will never pass away. It will remain. Here's something else also worthy to consider. Just as a short argument when you look at the New Testament salvifically, meaning there is certain demands that God places upon us to make sure that we understand the gospel so we can be saved by it. Listen to this. Uh, In John chapter 6, verse 63, Jesus speaks. He says, the words that I've spoken to you, that is spirit and life. Now, why is this important? Well, it is important because it is incumbent upon God if he gives you a law or if he gives you a decree to make sure that what you need to obey is in good stead because that's what he demands for you to follow. So in other words, if we look at the argument, we can say, if you believe in corruption, the actual change of God's words, you are actually proclaiming that God is not sufficient to keep it. Well, all through the New Testament, all throughout the New Testament scriptures, we can see quite clearly that Jesus makes it clear. Chapter after chapter, we can see that every single New Testament book speaks, decrying and speaking of its own authenticity. Then also, We can see quite clearly in John 14, verse 24 to 26, the the assumption is given that that which is handed over to us and that which is spoken to us is given and it is true, it is essential, it is preserved, and it is the word of God. Now, I don't know about you, but it needs to be emphatically stated as a community that believe that God has spoken. I'm speaking to all three communities, Jews, Christians, and also to Muslims. If we believe that God has spoken, Christians need to believe even that God has spoken in the New Testament. And we must believe that what he has said is assured and preserved and inspired by him. And therefore, we can believe it is sure. So I leave you with this. If we look at the overall picture of what is being delivered to us, we can see quite succinctly and quite clearly that the gospel that we've received the the New Testament books outside of the Gospels that we've received, the reason we hold onto them as being authoritative is because they all speak in unison. It is not something that is formulated by a later council. It's not something that is brought together by a later council. It is something that is rather recognized. Did the church have a history where they looked at certain books and said, hey, what about this book? What about that book? Yes, that was a history. They needed to recognize, they needed to put themselves in a place where they recognize what God has said. 
but there was never doubt in the Christian community's minds that that which God has said was sure. And I leave you with this thought. If we truly believe that God has spoken, all three our communities do this, we need to agree upon the very fact that because we believe God has spoken, we also believe in unison that he can preserve and uphold these words. And I leave you with that. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Pastor Rudolf. Uh, your timing is absolutely perfect. 19 minutes and 35 seconds. So uh, we owe you a few seconds. Thank you very much. Thanks for your cooperation thus far um, uh, for the, to the uh, audience. Next up, obviously, is uh, our brother Adnan Rashid, uh, who I introduced early on as a visitor from um, the UK. I did say at the function last night that um, I think he's now become a son of Cape Town because he just loves the place. And uh, uh, he may settle, yes, at some point. All right, so to be fair, your time starts now. Okay, before you start my time, very quickly I have a few words to say. Um, Rudolf has been a friend and we are uh, not only friends in person, we have met each other before. We had a debate uh, a few years ago, just before COVID, and we are Facebook friends as well. <laughs> I like to share uh, gifts. Um, Rudolf is a friend of uh, Dr. James White, who is a common friend of, our, of ours. And uh, we have exchanged gifts before, and today I have uh, something interesting for Rudolf to introduce the, the Muslim civilization, its achievements to him. I'm pretty sure he's well, well read, and he has read books before, but this one um, has some interesting uh, aspects uh, of the Muslim civilization addressed. The book is Making Sense of Islamic Art and Architecture. So not only the book contains uh, content on Islamic art and architecture, but I have an actual um, piece of Islamic civilization, a historic piece of Islamic civilization. It's a coin from the Mughal era. It is minted by Shah Jahan, the architect or the instigator of the famous Taj Mahal, right? So this is a coin minted by him, Shah Jahan, in India. And uh, this coin goes to Rudolf as a token of my gratitude and friendship towards him with the book. Thank you so much. Okay, my time starts now. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, alhamdulillah, wa salatu wa salamu ala rasulillah ma'bad. Ladies and gentlemen, brothers and sisters, I am very glad to be here today. I am honored to be in Cape Town. I am indeed a son of Cape Town. And I do uh, love this uh, city very much, no doubt. Today's topic is the New Testament canon, man-made or divine. Although the New Testament has been addressed many times in debates between Christians and Muslims. And this topic has been discussed for centuries, hundreds of years. But this particular angle the canon hasn't been addressed, to my knowledge, between Muslims and Christians. I mean, I can be corrected later on if there is such a debate. I would love to watch it. But the veracity of the New Testament, its authenticity, its, its historicity has been addressed, has been debated by many scholars in the past. So in that sense, this is a unique topic. The canon of the New Testament. What is a canon? Canon is a Greek word which means a yardstick, a standard to measure. This is the meaning of the word canon. And this word was used specifically to describe a collection of authoritative books in the fourth century for the first time. 
even by Christians. The word canon, as far as the scripture is concerned, was used for the first time in the 4th century. And that was used by the church historian Eusebius, who was writing around 325 CE, and he used the word canon to describe an authoritative list of New Testament books. And then later on, this word was, was used by uh, later church fathers, such as Athanasius, and we will come to talk about him in due course. So, before I get to the canon, I want to talk about, briefly, the concept of Scripture. What is Scripture? Rudolf talked about God speaking, God talking to humanity. The question is, how do we know when God spoke, how he spoke, through whom he spoke? These questions are very important. How do we know what we think God said is actually God's words? How do we know that what we think may have come from God is actually from God? This is a very important discussion. And we apply the same criteria, same standard to the Quran. The reason why we're having this debate is today, uh, today is that this question of canon applies to the New Testament more so than it applies to the Quran because there is hardly any debate there. Scholars, Western scholars who have addressed the canonicity of the Quran and the standardization of its text, they have declared repeatedly. In fact, most recently, a scholar named Nikolai Sinai, he stated that the Quran was canonized very early on during the lifetime of the companions of the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. In fact, Uthman bin Affan, when he uh, put the Quran through a standardized, uh, standardization process, since then the Quran, its text, its uh, order of chapters has been static. There are no changes made since the very time of the companions, the disciples of Muhammad, peace be upon him. And these are the people who took the Quran directly from the Prophet. These are the authorities who give us the Quran. So there is no debate there. The reason we are having this debate on the canon of the New Testament is because the debate is still going on. It is still very much alive. What constitutes the word of God? Which book is to be included in to a collection of scripture? Who decides that a book is from God? These are very, very important pressing questions. Rudolf has given you an excellent introduction to the formation of the New Testament, what later on uh, came to be known as the New Testament, the collection of books called the New Testament. It did not exist for the first 300 years. I'm talking about the collection called the New Testament. The books existed. They were written. I have no problem uh, in accepting that the four Gospels were already, already written before the first century was over. I have no problem with that notion. I have no problem with the fact that Paul had written his letters, most of them at least, within the first century. But the question is, these books, when did they gain the status of scripture? Were they actually written as scripture? Was Paul writing his epistles as scripture? Was Luke writing his gospel as scripture, as the word of God? Was John writing his book as scripture? Was Matthew writing his book as scripture? These are very important pressing questions. This is why when we go to the early history of Christianity, looking at some of the early church fathers, even they did not call these books scripture. They did not consider these books of the New Testament, strictly speaking, the word of God. As far as they were concerned, the Old Testament was scripture. Some of the early church fathers in the first century and in the second century did not see the books of the New Testament as we know them today as scripture. How did these books gain the status of scripture is a very pressing question. So if we look at some examples, for example, Clement of Rome did not refer to the books of the New Testament as scripture. Ignatius of Antioch did not refer to these books as scripture. Barnabas, Polycarp of Smyrna, Hermas of Rome, none of these church fathers 
who are very important in Christian history consider the books of the New Testament as scripture. So what did they call these books is the question. What was the status of these works written about Jesus Christ? People expressing their ideas, their views, their perception, their conception of Jesus Christ in their own ways, in their own words, in their own styles, in different works. So not only we find these four Gospels written, we have many other Gospels that were written at the time. And we even find manuscripts of them, some of them coming from the first century. There is a Gospel called the Unknown Gospel. And there is a manuscript of it. And there is a miracle attributed to Jesus Christ in this particular gospel, which we cannot find in any of the canonical works. And that manuscript is very early. It comes, the earliest date uh, given to this particular manuscript is the early second century. The same date given to the earliest manuscript of one of the books of the New Testament, the Gospel of John which is early 2nd century. So these Gospels, like the Gospel of Peter, for example, was very popular in the 2nd century among Christians, just as the Gospel of Mark was very popular. Gospel of John was disputed heavily. The Gospel of John was considered to be a Gnostic document. Now, what is Gnosticism? I, don't, I simply do not have time to indulge in that particular question, but let me tell you this much, that Gnosticism was a heretical idea. Most Christians rejected Gnosticism as something heretical. It was unorthodox. So Gnostics were a bunch of mystics who believed in certain set of ideas and these ideas were rejected by the main body of Christians. Even the Christians in the second and the third century believed in different things. They did not have a uniform belief in Jesus Christ and his mission. They had different conceptions of Jesus Christ and they had different ideas about his ministry, his preaching, his, his message for that matter. They did not have one view of Jesus Christ. And this was due to the diversity of documents they were reading as authoritative biographies of Jesus Christ, if not scripture. So as far as these early church fathers and early Christians are concerned, in the second and the third century, they are reading the memoirs of the apostles. The names they gave to these documents, the Gospel of Mark, the Gospel of Luke, the Gospel of John, the Gospel of Matthew, the Gospel of Peter, the Gospel of Thomas, and the list goes on. These church fathers gave the name to these documents. They called these documents memoirs of the apostles, at least in the second century. It was in the third century when these documents, some of these documents, if not all, started to gain the status of scripture. They were put on par with the Old Testament in the 3rd century, not in the 1st or the 2nd century. It happened in the 3rd century. Now my question is, how do we know that these documents actually came from God as an inspiration? Who makes that choice? And those who are making these choices, do we know the criteria? Do we understand what standards they were using? to decide what may be scripture and what may not be scripture, what may be from God and what is not from God. Because effectively, if a book is not part of the canon, what we call a chosen list of books, an authoritative collection of books, this is what canon means, right? So canon must constitute scripture and scripture must be canonized. It has to be canonical. Anything outside of that list of chosen books cannot be the word of God. The word or the title, the description given to those books is apocrypha. These are apocryphal works. The closest parallel I can give, Islamically speaking, is Sahih Hadith and the Da'if Hadith. The authentic narration of the Prophet ﷺ and an inauthentic narration of the Prophet ﷺ. So an inauthentic narration of the Prophet ﷺ is dubious. It cannot be attributed to the Prophet with certainty, with confidence, because it has problems. The report has problems with it, right? So this is a similar standard applied by Christians in those centuries, in the second and third century. So that's why many church fathers had different books in their lists. 
So when you go to the third and the uh, second and third century of Christianity, you see a lot of these church fathers, they have different lists of canonical books. If they considered them the word of God, scripture, they had different books in the lists. For example, Irenaeus, he omits from his list second and third John, the book of James, the book of Jude, second Peter and the book of Acts. On top of that, his list con contained an apocryphal work which he considered to be authoritative, which was the book of Hermas. Then Clement of Alexandria, a very important figure in uh, the history of the church. He omits one, two, three, John. Then one and two, Peter. He omits Revelation and the book of James. On top of that, he contains, or his list contains, Barnabas and Apocalypse of Peter as canonical, as an authoritative book. Origen, a very important figure in the 3rd century who died in 254 CE, a very, very important figure. In fact, Origen was um, the teacher of a man called Pamphilus, and Pamphilus was the teacher of the church historian Eusebius, who is extremely important in the history of 4th century Christianity. Origen had omitted James, Jude, and Acts from his list of authoritative books. So Eusebius, a very important figure, already mentioned, omits James, Jude, 2 Peter, and 2 and 3, uh, 2nd and 3rd John from his list. So why am I telling you this? Why am I telling you this? That even the church fathers in the first three centuries, in particular the 2nd, 3rd, and 4th century, their lists were not uniform. They were not unanimous on the word of God. What is the word of God? What may be regarded as the word of God? Um, we're not discussing the text of the New Testament here. We're not even discussing the authorship of these books because even that is a huge problem. Who wrote the Gospels? Who wrote the Gospels? No one knows to this day. You may be thinking, what about Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John? What about these names? No Christian scholar on the planet, conservative or liberal, will claim with absolute certainty, with evidence, that these documents were definitely written by these individuals, whoever they may be. Attribution to these documents with these names was made in the early 2nd century by a man called Papias of Hierapolis. That's the first time when names were given to these documents uh, according to recorded history. And even Papias is being quoted by a 4th century authority called Eusebius, already mentioned, almost 250 years apart. This is, absolute, this is absolute, absolutely crazy that there is a break of 250 years between the first witness to the names given to these Gospels and the person who documents them for the rest of uh, Christianity. So even these four documents were seen as anonymous documents. To this day, Christian scholars are not unanimous as to who wrote the Gospel of John. Who wrote the Gospel of John? There are three candidates. According to the New Jerome's biblical commentary, thank you, there are three candidates. <clears throat> Number one is John of Ephesus. Number two, John, the son of Zebedee. Or number three, John the Presbyter. To this day, no one knows who wrote the Gospel of John. So this is another question. We're not addressing that question today. We're dealing with the canonicity of these Gospels. How did they come to be seen as the Word of God or as Scripture? Who chose? What was the criteria? We have a scholar called Bruce Metzger who was a Christian, believing Christian. He tells us what criteria was used by the church if there was something called the church. Okay, even that concept of the church in the first three centuries is problematic. Which church, which group, which scholar? Because there was no unanimity on beliefs, on ideas, on the extent of devotion of Christians towards Jesus Christ. There was no unanimity. There was no uniformity. Christians were all divided on beliefs, as I stated earlier, due to the amount of different documents they were reading as authoritative uh, views on Jesus Christ. Many different Christians 
were reading many different books. And this is why there is an author called Bart Ehrman who has already debated people like James White and other Christian scholars. He authored a book titled Lost Christianities. Lost Christianities because there were many Christianities. There were many different churches. So when Christian apologists today claim that the church chose the canon, the church brought the canon forth, they don't know what they're talking about because which church is the question? Who? How? Where? Which person? Which church father? What criteria? None of these issues have been satisfactorily addressed by Christian scholars to date. But what we do have is a worked out standard that may have been used by early church fathers to reach this uh, idea of the canon. So Bruce Metzger states in his uh, book, The Canon of the New Testament, published in 1987 on page 251, he states, a basic prerequisite for canonicity was conformity to what was called the rule of faith. That is the congruity of a given document with the basic Christian tradition uh, re recognized as normative by the church. As I said earlier, that even the concept of, uh, of church is highly problematic in the first three centuries. Just as under the Old Testament, the message of a prophet was to be tested not merely by the success of the predictions, but by the agreement of substance of the prophecy, which the fundamentals of Israel's religion. So also under the new covenant, it is clear that the writings, uh, the, uh, clear that writings which came with any claim to be authoritative were judged by the nature of their content. So if the content fits the belief, then a book is accepted as authoritative. If the content does not fit the belief, then it is thrown out of the canon. It cannot be scripture. So let me explain that in simple terms. Christians came to believe in certain things for whatever reason, in different places, at different times, throughout the Christian world in the first 300 years of Christianity. They came to believe in different things, in different ways, in different places. Now they started to use those preconceived or presumed beliefs to judge the word of God, not the other way around. So the beliefs were not according to the word of God. The word of God has to be according to the beliefs. This is what Bruce Metzger is telling you. So this is how the church, the church got the canon, the collection of authoritative books we know today. So this is very clearly stated by Christian scholars. So to summarize very quickly, there are many problems with this question. We cannot possibly address all of them fully, comprehensively in one sitting. Each and every single point I mentioned needs a separate debate. And Christian scholars are debating this to this day. There is one book I strongly recommend on this very point. It is titled The Canon Debate. The Canon Debate. And one of the editors is a scholar mentioned by Rudolf. Lee Martin McDonald. Check that book out and you'll be blown away. Thank you so much for listening. Thank you, um, Ustad Adnan. Uh, you have two seconds in, in your bank. Thank you for your cooperation thus far, people. All right, so I think we've covered two sessions, uh, one each uh, for each speaker at, at uh, 20 minutes. Uh, that's gone quite well. Uh, we now have rebuttals, and uh, obviously we're going to ask Pastor Osof to 15 minutes, one five. Thank you. Well, thank you so much, Adnan. Uh, it is always wonderful to have an opportunity to speak about some of these textual issues. I hope I can do justice to everything that you've asked. You know, just as I do, we can probably go on for weeks just on this topic. So I'm going to try to once more establish and try to explain exactly why I started with the common conception of the first Christian community and their understanding of canon. We heard the question being asked, no written scripture except the Old Testament. What governed and what guided the first Christian community? Well, scholars like Michael Kruger, and even if you look at um, Lee uh, MacDonald, 
agree upon the fact that when we look at the first Christian community, they already had a canon in check, which they used to deduce the prophetic fulfillment and coming and message of, from Jesus by. And that was the Old Testament. They used the Old Testament canon in that fashion. And we can see quite clearly that when we look at the scriptural position of the New Testament, it is written to show us emphatically how the Old Testament was fulfilled. Now, this was the first Christian community's teaching. The question when the teaching became book, that is a question of discussion. But both MacDonald and both Kruger agrees upon the fact, even Metzger, that the New Testament as we have it in actual fact came into existence quite rapidly after the first Christian movement and the first apostolic move of the first apostles. Uh, interestingly enough, we can see quite clearly that the memoirs of the apostles were mentioned. Yes, Justin Martyr refers to the fact that in the first century community, uh, the memoirs of the, uh, of the apostles were already integrated uh, into the Christian service. And you can read that in his first apology. Now, this is 155 Anno Domini. Uh, and when we look at, uh, for instance, Ignatius of Antioch, he, he quotes some New Testament books quite early. Uh, he quotes it in 110. Polycarp of Smyrna, 7 to 155 Anno Domini. Uh, if you look just at Polycarp of Smyrna, he quotes 17 of the New Testament books. Well, why were all of these books not together? Well, because some of them were written. Uh, th they're only now in a process where they are starting to acknowledge and starting to see this book solidify solidify in the very Christian community. Did the question of canon get answered today when we look just merely at what is assumed to be lost? No, because I've repeated very early on that when we look at the first Christian community, it's an oral formae community. It's a community that knows exactly what the first teaching of the community was, and they knew exactly what the central teaching of Jesus was like. So how do we know what God says in his words? And uh, how do we know that that which was given is uh, accepted as, God, as the canon, especially when we look at Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Well, Lee Martin McDonald says that. He says, and rem remember, I said this to you in the opening, whatever else may be said about the early Christian writings or the gospel, they were first of all calls to faith in Christ Jesus, who was the final authority for the church from the beginning. Jesus had no rivals in the church, and uh, he was the center of the presupposition of early Christian literature. There is no doubt that the first Christian community vested their understanding of what Jesus said in Jesus. And then also this given promise that I've mentioned in my opening that the Holy Spirit will preserve that which what Jesus has said. So the question of the Gospels, who gave the Gospel their names? Well, yes, that is another question. Uh, but in what I shared in my opening argument, I did not really contend for the authors to be known. In actual fact, uh, it does not have to be that we need to know the authors because of the pre-existing teaching which is already in the community, and therefore we can just affirm what was written in these books. But interestingly enough, when we look very early on, we can see, uh, Adnan has mentioned it with Papias uh, in 120 Anno Domini, he mentions Matthew and Mark by name. Uh, Marcy and the heretic also in 145 AD mentions Luke. Justin mentions Mark and Luke in 150. Irenaeus that Adnan mentioned mentions all four Gospels in 170, and we can go on and on and on. But the interesting thing is that is very important is every time we hear anything about the four Gospels, it is never making mention of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and Johnny or Billy. It always speaks emphatically of the four as being Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Nowhere in antiquity is there any dispute as to what is written in the books, but we do not make anything about the authorship. Uh, and uh, a liberal scholar by the name of Armand D. Baum tell us why. He says that one of the reasons why the uh, canonical gospels might not have, to have bare names, and we do not have the originals, so we do not know. He says, unlike the Greek or Roman historian who, amongst the other things, wanted to earn praise and glory for his literary achievement from both the contemporaries and its posterity, not so with the New Testament gospel authors. The anonymity of the gospels can be rooted in a deep conviction and concern for the ultimate priority of their subject matter. Also remember, they were written quite early and they were under persecution, so uh, we do not know if they may be left out because they didn't want to be persecuted. Who was instrumental in choosing the New Testament canon? Well, I mentioned in my opening argument that the authority of the Holy Scripture 
as a believing community that believes that God has spoken, depends not upon the testimony of any man, but upon the testimony of God, neither the testimony of the church. The church merely recognized that which was perceived to be the word of God. G.I. Williamson espouses this principle. He says, if scripture is the word of God, then obviously it must, be the, it must possess the divine authority within itself. And if it possesses divine authority, then it cannot and need not depend on anything else or any other than God. Authority can depend only on that which is higher than itself. And God is the highest authority. We dearly believe like Muslims do with their text. We believe that God has spoken. And what God has said is authoritative. So, in the first three centuries where it says uh, that uh, uh, Athanasius mentions the list. And uh, when we look at the texts quite clearly, we can see quite clearly that there was not really something that held the belief and the central edifice of what the community held dear together. That is simply not so. The first Christian community in and of themselves, Wayne Grudem says the following. He says, where did this idea of canon begin? It started with the people of Israel. Remember, the guys that are writing the Gospels, they are from a Jewish community. And he says, this Jewish community always kept written records about the will of God. He says, Scripture itself bear witness to the historicity and the development of this canon. The earliest collection of written words of God was the Ten Commands for the Jewish people. He says, but again and again, when we look at the New Testament people, the collection of the New Testament books were absolutely authoritative words from God that grew because the people came from this history of writing down the collection of books. The first Christian community were not opposed to books. They did not need them. Uh, they, in actual fact, started writing books down once the, 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 the uh, persecution broke out and once they realized that this needed to be preserved. But the first Christian community in and of themselves make it absolutely clear that what emerges out of the church is recognized as that being what is authoritative. Now, if you look at the 27 books, the question was asked, who chose these books? Uh, well, Lee Martin McDonald writes, the preaching of the early church focused on Christ, first of all, his deeds, his presence in the kingdom of God, his manifestation of his words and deeds. In other words, and again, Jesus was the locus of authority for the earliest Christian movement. And as the church grew in its understanding of its mission and its result, scattered by persecution, it soon became necessary to communicate with new churches. And this often took place in form of written letters when personal visits were not possible. It is clear from the beginning of the church, not later, from the beginning of the church, that the sayings of Jesus had a scripture-like authoritative status in the churches, whether these sayings and deeds were written in oral form or not. In other words, the community made sure that whatever was spoken about Jesus could be kept sure. Uh, the New Testament books, in other words, there's a, a clever word for it, is autopistic. It means that itself authenticates itself, and the canon authenticates itself because it's spoken of God. Now again, when we look at the accusation that is made against the New Testament, is that it cannot be uh, written from God um, because the apostles did not maybe even know that they were writing Scripture. Well, N.T. Wright sums it up well. He says, it, it, it used to be said that the New Testament writers didn't think they were writing Scripture. That is hard to sustain historically today. The fact that they were writing in various senses occasionally is not the point. At precisely those points of urgent need, when, for instance, writing to the Galatians or to 2 Corinthians by someone like Paul is most conscious of the fact that he is the one that is authorized through apostolic succession by the apostolic call he had received from Jesus Christ and in the power of the Spirit to bring life and order to the church by his words. Let me tell you something. The first Christian community understood the apostolic function of these individuals. And like Jesus said in John 14, 26, the very words that they would write, the Holy Spirit will inspire it, bring it back to remembrance, and they will write the will of God. So when, I've got, thanks. Uh, when were the Gospels written? We heard that there was quite a late date. But with the model of canon formation I've presented, it is really inconsequential when exactly the Gospels would be penned. Uh, because the established community would have already had a set proximity of what the gospel was. The question of when the verba or the vox of Christ would become a book is not the right research question. 
to ask when you deal with an, uh, especially when you deal with an oral formulaic community. Uh, Professor Philip Comfort, though, gives us uh, an approximation, especially for the four Gospels, like we asked when were they written. Uh, and he says the following, and Adnan concedes that it is almost universally recognized that the four Gospels were penned in the first century and that all others, that is the Gnostic text, the Gnostic Gospel of Thomas, which the earliest date they pushed it down to was about 120 Anno Domini came only in the second century and thereafter. Thus, the authentication and the authenticity of Jesus' statements in the non-canonical Gospels should be judged by what we see in the canon of the Gospels, not vice versa. Well, we heard Barty Erdmann says that there are certain texts that arose that we need to contend with. Well, let me tell you what Bart Erdmann says. And he cautions us. And he says the following. Uh, he says, if historians want to know what Jesus said and did, they are more or less content to use the New Testament Gospels as their principal resources. Moreover, the Gospel accounts outside of the New Testament tend to be late, legendary, and of no considerable interest in themselves. That is Bart Erdmann. That is the individual that Adnan quoted. So, what can we say about the very Word of God in the New Testament and uh, the authority of the text? Uh, well, we heard it said that, that Bruce Metzger said quite emphatically and clearly that, that he's in doubt of the New Testament and that the New Testament was corrupted. I would say when you read both of the books of Metzger, go look for what it means when he speaks about corruption. It does not mean the same as what we hear today. Today we think corruption is people that actually went and took out the books of the New Testament all over the world which is uh, distributed all over the known world of antiquity, and, and then they changed it and put it back together. It is not so. That's not the corruption Metzger is speaking of. Metzger is rather speaking, and he's saying that the text in and of itself has certain variant, uh, uh, variants in it. And when we collate those variants, when we have four manuscripts that have been handwritten and we put it together, there will be differences, and that's what we find. But what about these differences? Well, Barty Erdmann says, when we put all of the manuscripts back together and we collate them and we look at what they said, there are no uh, 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 noticeable errors within them that will lead us to believe something different to what the New Testament Gospels have said. No, my friends, the New Testament once and all is sure. It is not corrupt. Uh, interestingly enough, I just want to remind you of what I said about the Quran's estimation of the New Testament. And um, I know Adnan already uh, spoke of that, but, but I want to appeal and speak to you once more and ask the question, why only in the first century of the Muslim era, we look at some of the conversations, they believe that it's the meaning of the Quran that was changed, not the text. But now and later at times, we see that the liberal notions are taken up and used as a vestment against Christianity. Early Muslims did not believe it. I've got pages after pages of Mahmoud Ayyub, Muhammad Abdul, the Egyptian scholar. I can go on and on. I can even read to you what is mentioned and said by Bukhari. I can read to you and tell you exactly what is said by Ibn Abbas when he speaks about the Gospel of John. These individuals spoke fondly of the New Testament. They never said that these books were written out they were changed to such a degree that we cannot noticeably know what it said. Not at all. In actual fact, some of these individuals affirm what the prophet said. And I've mentioned it to you in my opening presentation. The prophet even speaks to the Al-Kitab, the people of the book. And he tells us to search and to look within it. Now, I know a lot of Muslims will say, yeah, there's some light, but not all light. I'm saying to you, God speaks authoritatively. And God speaks clearly. And no man can change his word. The Quran says it. And the New Testament says it, and I'm going to stick with that. I'm going to believe God, not liberal scholars. Thanks. Thank you, uh, Pastor. Uh, you have 10 seconds in your bank. Thank you very much again for your cooperation. Next up again for rebuttal, Adan Rashid. Thank you for that rebuttal, Pastor Rudolf. I will now respond to some of the points you have raised. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Firstly, 
uh, you mentioned that the New Testament, um, um, basically the Quran talks about it. The Quran does not talk about the New Testament anywhere. The Quran does not mention anything about the New Testament. The Quran doesn't even mention any of the authors of the New Testament. Whatever names you give those uh, authors or whatever names you may attribute to those books, the Quran doesn't even entertain the possibility of the plurality of Gospels. When the Quran mentions the message of Jesus Christ, it refers to it in singular terms. Injil, which is one message, one book, not anajila, or not, you know, a plurality of messages. What you have is a plural, um, um, plurality of Gospels. You have four Gospels, right? The Quran doesn't even entertain that possibility. So the Quran refers to the original message of Jesus Christ, which was original with him, which he taught his companions. So when uh, Jesus Christ was saying those words, the Quran confirms some of them. So when the Quran says, for example, let the people of the gospel judge what God, Allah, has revealed therein. So what does that actually mean? Is the Quran now confirming the veracity and the authenticity of the gospels? Absolutely not. What the Quran is saying let the people of, I mean, the Quran is actually challenging the Christians to start believing in what actually originally came from Jesus Christ. That's the meaning of the verse. Follow what came from Jesus Christ because that was revealed by God, not what others have written in his name. This is the point the Quran is making. And how do you do that? You use the Quran as the criteria. The Quran itself refers to itself as Muhaymin which means the standard, the criteria. In other words, the canon. The Quran actually refers to itself as the canon. Okay, if you want to follow a canon, which is pure, which is definitely from God, which came directly from God, uncorrupted, unchanged, static, for the last 1,400 years since the time of the Prophet, peace be upon him, sallallahu alayhi wasallam, and that is the Quran. That is the Quran. That cannot be said about the books of the New Testament. Jesus has nothing to do with them. Jesus never asked for a New Testament. He never proposed it as a possibility. He never mentioned anything about it. He, even Paul had no idea about the New Testament. It wasn't intended. How do we know that this collection of books the Christians claim to be scripture today is from God? How do we know when Jesus has nothing to do with it? His companions, his disciples have nothing to do with it. None of the authors of the New Testament are eyewitnesses according to the Christian scholars themselves, including Paul. Paul never met Jesus Christ. It is claimed that he met his disciples. No doubt. It is claimed in the New Testament. Okay? So when Rudolf, when we ask him, who chose these books? Who said these books are scripture? Rudolf he takes us back to the scriptures. It's like a circular, uh, circular argument. Scripture says these books are, uh, uh, are from God and uh, then, then these books say that scripture is from God. So it's like a circular argument. W what we know is, what we want is, what we want from you is, Rudolf, come back and tell us who actually decided that these books are from God. This question, by the way, no scholar on the planet, PhD doctors in biblical theology and the history of the Bible, they haven't been able to answer this question. Including those conservative scholars, Rudolf has been referring to such as Michael Kruger, right? He is a, he's a conservative Christian scholar. He's a believing Christian. He hasn't, been, he hasn't been able to answer this question. He hasn't answered this question. He has written books upon books on this topic, in particular the canon of the New Testament, the answer is not there. Who chose these books? What names? Now let's say the church fathers, I'm going to help Rudolf here. Let's say church fathers chose these books, the first 300 years, right? Now that causes a bigger problem for us. Not only that we have multiple books traveling through Christian lands, some of them far more popular, far more read 
and celebrate it than the gospels we have today in the New Testament. Am I making this claim without substance or am I uh, using Christian scholars? I am using Christ Christian scholars who are telling me this, that the Didache, which was a text in circulation in the 2nd and the 3rd century, was far more popular in certain areas than the Gospels. The Gospel of Peter was on par with the Gospel of Mark. In fact, the manuscript evidence tells us that the Gospel of Peter was far more circulated than the Gospel of Mark itself because we find more manuscripts for the Gospel of Peter than we find for the Gospel of Mark. Why was it rejected? Who, th who threw it out is the question. So, when we try to help our Christian brothers and accept their claim that the church fathers chose these books, they are the ones who transmitted these books and they are the ones who decided that these books are to be included into the canon and they are the word of God by consequence. That causes a bigger problem to rise. Let me explain very quickly. Now, this is the shock. This is the shock. This, is, this may be the, the defining moment of the debate, right? All of the church fathers in the first 300 years, every single one of them, the ones mentioned by Rudolf and the ones mentioned by me, every single one of them is a heretic according to the current conception of Protestant, Catholic and Orthodox Christianity. Did you understand that? Did you get that? Shall I repeat it? Every single church father. It's like the Muslims saying, all the imams of the first 300 years of Islam, including Imam Ahmed bin Hanbal, Imam Shafi'i, Imam Abu Hanifa, Imam Malik, Sufyan al-Thawri, Lais bin Saad, Ishaq al rahwi all are scholars of fiqh and hadith for the first 300 years were a bunch of heretics. And amazingly, they are the ones who transmitted the Quran to us. They're the ones who gave us the sunnah of the Prophet ﷺ. They are the ones who preserved it. Now, if they are heretics or if their characters are in doubt, their beliefs are in doubt, can we now claim with confidence that we have the truth when we ourselves are condemning them? This is exactly what the Christians do today. Protestants, Catholics and Orthodox Christianity today condemns all of those Church fathers who lived before the year 300. Can I make this claim with confidence? Absolutely. Because every single one of them did not believe in the doctrine of the Trinity as Christians believe in it today. The doctrine of the Trinity in its current form was formalized and form, uh, formally declared or finally declared to be what it is today in the year 381 CE in the Council of Constantinople. Even the Council of Nicaea the Creed of Nicaea, which was issued by the Council of Nicaea in 325 CE, is a binitarian creed. Strictly speaking, it's not a Trinitarian creed. It was specifically discussing, this council was specifically discussing the matter of the nature of Jesus Christ. Who is he? Is he, God? Is he equal with God? Is he like God? Is he God himself, like God the Father? Or is he below God in some sense? This is the question that was discussed in the Council of Nicaea in 325 CE. Why am I mentioning these things? These points are directly relevant. So these people who chose the Gospels or the documents of the New Testament are a bunch of heretics. And if they're not, Rudolf can come and correct me. I will happily uh, accept that correction. Now, Rudolf mentioned Ibn Abbas quoting for the Gospel of John or praising it. I challenge you, Rudolf, to come back and give me the report where Ibn Abbas specifically mentions the Gospel of John. I'll be happy again to be corrected. Okay, now Rudolf said, we don't have to know the authors. We don't have to know the authors of the, the documents. We do have to know the authors. Let's say if J.K. Rowling was living in the second century, okay, and she wrote Harry Potter, and every single thing she wrote was in line with the church's beliefs, and she attributed the book to the, Jesus, to, to, to the life of Jesus Christ, would she be writing scripture? Because the criteria we have here in front of us, let's look at them very quickly. Scholars have come up with 11 criteria, having looked at the writings of the early church fathers, the kind of criteria they might have used 
to choose what may be canonical or what may be scripture. Thank you. Thank you. So one of them is apostolicity. Number one, scholars have come up with these criteria. Who, who, who scholars? Which scholars? Who am I talking about? I'm talking about Christian scholars. Many of them conservative Christian scholars. They want to actually know how did the New Testament came about. And then they gave us 11 criteria. And these criteria were not used consistently, applied consistently, neither were they applied universally. Okay? These standards vary from person to person, from church to church, from town to town, from city to city, from regions to regions. Apostol uh, apostolicity was one of them. So the document has to be apostolic. Number one, it has to be apostolic. But if you don't know who wrote it, how do you know it's apostolic? How do you know it's apostolic? If you don't know who wrote the document, it's an anonymous document. How do you know it's apostolic? Number two was the age of the document in question. It has to be ancient. Well, there are documents that are ancient and they cannot be found in the canonical gospels. They're not part of the canon. For example, one of them I mentioned, the unknown gospel. It mentions a miracle of Jesus Christ that he took water from River Jordan and he poured it on, on land and a tree came out as a miracle. We, the Muslims, can believe in it. No problem. We have no problem with that. In fact, the Quran refers to some of these apocryphal gospels. The Quran confirms the veracity of those particular stories. One of them, Jesus made birds and put life in them. This can be found in the gospel of Thomas. The infancy gospel of Thomas is there. It gives a story that Jesus made birds from clay and he was rebuked by Joseph and then he clapped and these birds, they flew away. Right? So we can believe this story. Not the entire gospel. We don't have to believe the entire gospel of Thomas, but that particular story is confirmed by the Quran. So it is definitely true. We believe it's definitely true. Right? Something like that happened. Likewise, Jesus spoke from cradle according to the Quran. When his mother was accused of adultery, the Jewish people of her town, they said, what is this? We knew you as a good woman. You cannot do this. And she pointed to the child. And the child spoke from cradle. And he said what he said. You can read the Quran chapter 19, Surah Maryam. Named after the mother of Jesus. And there is an entire chapter in the Quran named after the mother of Jesus. There's nothing in the, the New Testament named after Mary. Right? So, um, in this particular story, what are we told? That Jesus spoke from the cradle. We go to the infancy gospel of James we are told that Jesus spoke from the cradle. So there are apocryphal documents like that unknown gospel. Jesus may have done that miracle. The question is, who threw these gospels out? Why were these accounts thrown away? By whose choice? Who had the audacity to choose? Like, I have 20 books here, 20 books there. And I am now choosing at will. This one is from God. Okay, put it on that side. This one is from Satan. Put it on that side. Okay, this one. And of course, there were standards and criteria. I'm not, I'm not being crude. I'm not trying to have a go. And I'm not trying to be, I'm not mocking the system. But this is what it boils down to. There were people who were throwing books out at will. And they were taking books in at will. These church fathers. Because their lists are all uh, different. They are vary. Okay, they have different details. So the problem remains. I'm going to come back to the list of um, criteria very quickly. So the documents age. The third criteria is the historical likelihood of the of its constant if contents uh, its contents. So they have to be historical. They have to be like they can't be incredible events. You know something crazy happening, right? So one of the reasons gospel the gospel of Peter was rejected is that Jesus is shown to have come out of the cave. And a cross comes behind him. A cross. A standing giant cross comes behind him and the cross talks. The cross starts talking. This is one of the reasons why the gospel of Peter was rejected according to one of the discussions I was watching from Michael Kruger. Right? But then we have the gospel of Matthew that tells us that there, there were zombies walking around in the city of Jerusalem. Dead, dead people came out of their graves and they were walking around the city of Jerusalem. Now, 
if we apply that criteria to the gospel of Matthew, it all it can also be thrown out on those bases. Thank you, uh, Ustad. Uh, time up. Nadia Thank you so much. Up. So I have so, some more points to go through, which I can uh, during the Q&A if I get the chance. Thank you so much for listening, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you. All right, there we go. So we've heard the two um, kind of opposing views about the canonization of Scripture. Uh, I think we uh, understand what, what the concept means. Now it's time for Q&A. So let's kind of have very simple basic rules. I'd like to take three questions at a time. If you could, when you do pose a question, if you could perhaps indicate who you're posing the question to, and I think it'd be... Uh, common knowledge that you would maybe give us your name so we know who we're talking to. Keep it short, sharp, and succinct, please. Uh, so we give as many people uh, a chance to talk. We're going to try and keep it down to about 20 minutes, the Q&A. And then if there's, more, uh, if there's any more questions to ask, we'll try and see if we can fit them in. All right, so we start now with Q&A. Here's a question. If you could uh, identify yourself, please, and then pose the question. Assalamu alaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. My name is Talib Samai. Um, does it mean that the New Testament cancel out the Old Testament? Because in the Old Testament, Jesus teachings about eating pork, circumcision, fasting, the greeting, etc. Are that no more necessary for the Christians to follow? Pastor Rudolph? Can I just, when you do have the mic, can you keep the mic as close to your, your mouth as possible, please? Can, can, can you please repeat the question? Uh, Rudolf couldn't quite hear the question. Okay, um, does it mean that the New Testament cancel out the Old Testament? Because in the Old Testament, Jesus teaches about eating pork, circumcision, fasting, the greeting. So are there no more necessary for the Christians to follow because the New Testament canceled it out? I would say in the Old Testament, there is a specific purpose for the dietary law that God has laid out for his covenant people. Uh, obviously, it was done for their peculiarity, and it was done for his covenant relationship with them. In the New Testament, when the dietary law specifically changes, it is because God now has changed that specific covenant which is catered for the Israeli and Jewish people alone to all of the world and to all of the people. So the dietary constriction is really pointing to the exclusivity of the Jews, but in the New Testament, Jesus fulfills that laws, and he says now those things are permissive, meaning that everybody is included in the covenant, which is the point of the dietary laws in the Old Testament. All right. Any other questions? Hello. There's one at Salam. the back. Sorry. We. Oui. Wave at me. Okay, there we go. I'm, I'm Farid David. Well, my question is to Rudolf. Can Rudolf said that God decrees something and it it must be followed. No, I'm I'm asking Rudolf: Is Christianity decreed in the New Testament or the canon or whatever? A Christianity decree in, in the New Testament, like in the Quran, uh, Ustad will tell you that Islam is decreed in the, that's why we follow. You see, now the, the question is just Christianity, um, Christianity believe that the Christmas and uh, New and uh, Easter. It's the biggest celebration in Christianity. Can, can, can we can stick you, to the Can we stick to the topic, uh, speaker, please? Yeah, yeah. Can Can you tell me where in the in in the New Testament or the canon is is a decree if you follow the the, the Thank you. And, and and I think just to be courteous, please, it's Pastor Rudolf. I think one one must respect uh, the the speakers. So to start, and it's Pastor. Yeah, we, we uh, couldn't quite hear the, the, the question, um, uh, speaker. 
Can, can, you, can we just rethink the question and then rephrase it in a shorter way? We'll come back to you. There was a question somewhere here. There we go. Assalamu alaikum, uh, Pastor Sheikh. Uh, my name is Uthman Barnes. Um, I'll, my question basically, um, I'm asking for some clarification in terms of you mentioning it's not necessary to have the authority. Um, you mentioned, for example, you were quoting uh, a number of scholars, Lee Martin, McDonald, Kruger, Phillips, Metzger, etc., etc., to support your argument as authority, because from an academic perspective, you need um, proof or you need authoritative individuals to bring forth your argument so you have a source that you take as an authority. One of those individuals that you argued in your favor was Bart Ehrman, and you mentioned some of the books in, we, um, in which he speaks about the New Testament. However, the same author wrote um, the book, for example, misquoting Jesus, how the, story behind, how the story behind who changed the Bible and why, how Jesus became God, etc. So the same author that you're using to solidify your argument as someone that's speaking against what you put through. So using everything that I've just said now, sir, you've used authors and academic individuals to prove your point, but yet you insist that we do not need authority to solidify and confirm the word of God. And I quote, sir, you concluded your section, I'm going to believe God and not liberal scholars. Could you please comment on that and how we can Thank still you. not accept authority? Thank you. Thanks so much for the question. It's more of a statement, though. But uh, I will say the following. I would say for you to solidify what you believe in, ultimately, even when you come to the Quran, you're going to turn to the, what the Quran says about itself. That's the final authority. Not saying that there's no authority to judge by what we can deem in academia and scholarship to what is necessary to believe about the instance of the Quran or even the instance of the New Testament. That's not what I'm saying. I'm simply saying that the very authority vested in what God has said is God himself first. And we should look at that first. And when I look at God, when I look at the Quran, when I look at what the New Testament is saying, I think I've shown quite clearly in my opening statement that the Quran the New Testament, the sayings of Jesus, all is very positive about what Jesus has said and let us know. Uh, and there's nothing false in that, and I'll stick for that for the sake of the debate. Thank you. Where is the microphone? Here's this young gentleman. Assalamu alaikum. Um, <clears throat> big thanks for a very informative discussion. Your name, name, please. My name is Abdurrahman Sadin. Uh, my question is to Pastor Rudolph. And if it's possible that Ustad that Nan also maybe responds to it um, as he brought it up in the discussion. But it was a very pertinent statement or claim that was made that the church fathers, all of the church fathers up until or before the year 300 would be classified as heretical according to the standards today of Christianity and the councils that was held at Nicaea and the one that came later in 380, 381, I believe. So according to the standards, they all classified as heretical, having beliefs that is heretical. How would you respond to that if they are the ones that handed down to us the canon of the New Testament? If Ustad Adnan could also respond to that and Pastor Rudolph would be right. appreciated. Thank you. Maybe if you don't mind, I'm going to ask Adnan to restate that because I, I'm not sure I got it. Is that okay? And then I'll answer. Okay, I'll repeat again. I'm saying all the church fathers before the year 300 are heretical or he heretics in some degree or the other, uh, according to the Catholic, the Protestant, and Orthodox conception of Christianity as we know it today, in particular referring to the, uh, the, 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 the doctrine of the Trinity and other things. Yeah, is that a correct statement? Yeah, I would say, obviously, as a Christian, I, I do think there's value in conciliar Christology, which means, or uh, the councils, meaning that some of the councils can stipulate quite clearly what happened in the history of the church, in the belief of the church. But that being said, the ultimate authority to anathematize these individuals, whoever they are, in church history, as we saw historically, for instance, with Marcion, who believed that the Old Testament deity is a is, is a different deity than uh, what we see in the New Testament. And some other heretics that believe, for instance, Jesus did not have a physical body. 
the New Testament itself, because that's the vested authority of Christ. Remember, the words and the actions of Christ, what he delivered, what he said, that is where we vest the authority in. And that is the promise that is made by God in the New Testament, uh, that his very apostles, John 14, 28, will bring, he will bring, in verse 26, he will bring back to remembrance whatever he has said to these individuals. So God is the one uh, that brings to memory to those individuals what they needed to know. That being said, uh, anybody that is uh, in the first three centuries of the church is judged, and you can look at the conversations in church history. Man, the first three centuries of church history is rife with conversations surrounding the person of God, what type of humanity, etc., etc., what type of divinity, and we can go on and on and on. But all of those councils, in actual fact, discussed what is found in Scripture. It's not just man-made theology or man-made philosophy that these individuals are discussing. They are discussing actual Christian doctrine and scripture deduced from the text, which the health and I esteem as being authoritative. And therefore, I'm saying the, the scriptures in itself is the final authority for these three centuries and also for conciliar Christology afterwards. Very quickly, I will uh, comment on that. Rudolf just ended the debate there. He just, he just admitted that all of these people in the first three centuries were having conversations and debates on different ideas, different topics, different beliefs. And this is exactly what my point is. If these people in the first 300 years, some of them very, very highly learned people, okay, if they were not clear on their beliefs and they're still debating their beliefs, how can they then, how can they then use those beliefs as confused as they may be about them to choose the scripture? Because Bruce Metzger is saying the rule of faith was used to choose the scripture, to make the canon. And if that's the case, how can these people in the first 300 years have a view on scripture when they themselves are debating? Their beliefs are not clear yet. They're not decisive on those things. So this is the confusion which needs to be clarified from scholars. And uh, it hasn't been done to my knowledge to date. I think we can have a conversation like this all night. I'm not saying that the central beliefs of Christianity was under dispute. I'm not saying that at all. In actual fact, when we look at church history, the kerygma, the rule of faith that Adnan is speaking of, was solidified in the first century. You can read what Charles Dode said. He showed quite clearly that the earliest preaching and the earliest community already had, as we know, the gospel intact. And they were preaching and, and actually uh, uh, going forth into all the world as Jesus commanded and they were preaching this gospel. Those tenets are recognized. We can see it in church history. Nothing of the central beliefs of Christianity has changed. Have Christians discussed after the first dispensation of Christian era uh, what they believe, how they believe it? Yes. Uh, Muslims even today discuss and have certain discussions about belief uh, and, and how you need to derive your, your, your akida, etc., etc. Christians did the same. It does not mean that there was anything wrong with the foundation of their faith. I will make it very short. Rudolf said, Rudolf said that uh, the core beliefs of Christianity were well established. I am saying those very core beliefs were being debated. The divinity of Jesus Christ was debated. For the first 300 years, there were church fathers, heavy, heavyweights, who were saying Jesus is not God on par with the Father. Jesus is not God. So that's one of the core beliefs of Christianity as we know it today. Protestants, Catholics, and Orthodox are unanimous on that point. And so to say that the core beliefs were already established is, is, is an overstatement, in my opinion. All right, thank you. <laughs> last, last comment, but I have to say, if you look at the Council of Nicaea in 325 on a Domini, what is disputed is in what way is Jesus related to the Father when we speak of him as being God? The core issue of Jesus being God is not disputed. Uh, so in other words, the core doctrines of the church is held in high esteem, and it is vindicated from the third century up down to the first century. There is no dispute, and there's no one that is making a, uh, any dispute surrounding that. Thank you. Yeah, this gentleman. Ihsan Hendricks. Question to the Ustad. Was the New Testament canon finalized over a period of 400 years? And... What influence did politicians and the emperor have on the standardization 
of the New Testament. Sorry, repeat the second part, please. What influence did politicians and the emperor of the time have on the canonization of the New Testament? Okay, the first part, uh, was it finalized? Was the canon of the New Testament finalized in the fourth century? I will address that point first uh, very quickly, and I will use a scholar to answer your question who made it very, very clear that that wasn't the case, okay? And that scholar is, again, uh, Lee Martin MacDonald, a favorite scholar of Rudolph. This is what he had to say. Only during the Reformation did the Catholics achieve unity on the New Testament canon. With the decree by the Council of Trent, by that time, Luther had already denied full canonical status of James Hebrews, Jude, and Revelation, not to mention the deuterocanonical books, the Apocrypha. So what Lee Mac Martin McDonald is saying, one of the authorities on this very topic, that even up to the, uh, the period of Reformation, which is the 16th century, 16th century, the canon of the New Testament is still being debated. And according to some scholars, the question is still not closed. The word of God can still be uh, thrown out or added in to the canon. Some Christian scholars are still arguing to this day that we should throw out these uh, apocalyptic books from the New Testament, such as the book of Revelation, to unite the Christians. Others say, no, we shouldn't do that because it's going to cause more problems than solutions. So that's the answer to your first question. The second question, whether if you are referring to Emperor Constantine uh, in choosing the, the, the canon of the New Testament, that's, that's a misconception. That's not true. That's historically inaccurate. Constantine had nothing to do with the canon of the New Testament. Uh, Yeah, we have it now. Okay, so so that notion that Constantine had something to do with the making of the canon is not correct. He did have something to do with the the term homoousius that was actually added to the Creed of Nicaea. This is very clearly testified uh, to by J. N. D. Kelly in his History of Christian Doctrine that Constantine, by his express wish, the term homoousius that God the Father and Jesus Christ are of the same essence, that term to describe that particular idea, um homoousius in the Greek language was added at the express wish of Constantine. But he has nothing to do with the canon. All right, thank you. Uh, this young lady here? Yes. Ustad Adnan. Your, your name, please? Uh, Asinu Raja. Asinu Raja. Ustad Adnan, you mentioned that the Quran doesn't talk about the New Testament but about what came from Jesus. So how are we supposed to know what came from Jesus in the 21st century if it was not written down? And if it was written down and it, was, and it has disappeared from the face of the earth, does that mean that God doesn't, can't preserve his word as, it was, as uh, Pastor Rudolph uh, mentioned over and over again? And if it is... Surely, if the Quran referred to that book that contained what came from Jesus, so it was an important book. So if it has disappeared now, if it doesn't exist any longer, isn't there okay. an, an Islamic responsibility to, to have tracked it and to have tried to preserve it for the world? Very good question. Thank you for asking that question. I must mention here that our view on the Bible as a whole is that the Bible contains the truth, it contains uh, fables, 
It contain, contains dubious information. It contains outright lies and myths. So uh, the Bible is a collection of uh, correct information, authentic information that may have come from God originally, and it also contains other information that cannot possibly be from God. So this is our view on the Bible. Now, how do we reach that conclusion? This is where I come to the second point you raised. We use the Quran as the criteria. We believe the Quran is definitely the word of God. We have very strong, powerful reasons to believe that. And that's another discussion and debate. And based upon the Quran, whatever the Quran confirms, we accept. Now, do we need uh, the New Testament and the Old Testament to believe in God and worship him? Absolutely not. We don't need the Old Testament and the New Testament. Okay, because those books, as far as the Quran is concerned, have been changed. They've been changed beyond uh, recognition. You know, we, we don't know what, how much has been changed and how, mu how much has been left out. We don't know. Okay, this much is confirmed by Jewish and Christian scholars as well, that these books are not in, in their pure form. As they were written by those alleged authors once upon a time, these books as we find them today are not in that form. That original form has been lost completely. We don't know what Matthew, Mark, Luke and John, uh, those anonymous, uh, anonymous authors once upon a time wrote. So Quran, how does the Quran know what Jesus said? Quran knows that because God tells us what Jesus may have said. God revealed the Quran and God tells us this is what Jesus said. For example, in chapter 5 we are told, Jesus said to the Israelites, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one God. Okay, now that can be found in the Gospel of Mark. Do we believe that's from Jesus? Absolutely. I believe that information definitely originated from Jesus. What Mark or whoever the author was found via an oral tradition which was around at the time. Now that doesn't mean that I go around, start believing in the gospel of Peter, the gospel of, as far as we the Muslims are concerned, the gospel of John, the gospel of Matthew, Luke, Mark, Peter, uh, Mary Magdalene, and Thomas, and Judas, and the list of gospels goes on and on and on. We are, as far as we are concerned, they're all exactly the same to us. We don't believe in this canonical system the church used and decided that these books should be kept in and the other books should be thrown out. For example, very quickly, I'm finishing. I know, I know you're going to now punch me in a second. Okay? So, no, no, you're not going to do that. Okay. The Gospel of Thomas, one of the reasons I can see why it was thrown out, the Gospel of Thomas as we know it today, um, it contains 114 sayings of Jesus Christ. 114 hadith, you can say, of Jesus Christ. One of them states that God cannot be born of a woman. God cannot be born of a woman. Where's the problem now? How does that contradict with current Christianity? Because current Christianity tells you God was born of a woman. Okay? God, who is Jesus, was born of a woman. Therefore, the Gospel of Thomas was thrown out. As noble, as moral, as beautiful as, as it may be, as authentic, as ancient as it may be, because some scholars dated uh, on par with Q tradition, even before the Gospel of Mark, the earliest gospel. Some scholars, such as April D. D. McConnick, uh, she puts the Gospel of Thomas before the Gospel of Mark. I and mean, that's her opinion. I don't have to accept it. I have no problem with that. So this is an issue, right? Uh, that gospel was rejected possibly because it says God cannot be born of a woman. So this is what the, what's happening in the first three centuries. People are forming beliefs and if the gospel, a gospel, a given gospel doesn't fit those beliefs, doesn't agree with those beliefs, it's thrown out. This is the game that was played. Thank you, uh, Pastor Rudu. Yeah, I just quickly want to comment that Adnan just gave me the debate. He just said that we can only establish that which is authoritative by what God have established. That was the argument that I made the whole night. Uh, in actual fact, I'm not making an argument that the church in actual fact placed the canon on a special place and therefore we should believe the canon. The argument that I made tonight is, is that both the Quran, both the Old Testament and its expectation and the New Testament makes it absolutely sure that the words of God is sure and God will speak authoritatively and he will preserve it. If it is incumbent upon God to let you believe certain things about what he demands, it's incumbent upon God to keep what he said in check for you to actually uh, obey that. 
Think about that. The accusation that any form of scripture that is written is falsified, like the New Testament, like we hear tonight, that the New Testament is false, falsified by the hand of man, tells us that God cannot preserve his text. It's an accusation against God. Further, we see, and there's a lot of, even in his presentation, Adnan mentioned, and he admitted openly that there are certain spurious writings within the Quran that is affirmed by the Quran. And it is. We can look at this Mitrash Rabbah, there's the book of Jubilees. There are stories within the Quran, and you can go have a look for yourself. I wrote a whole blog article about it, which we know for a fact was written by men that did not write in, under inspiration. But it's in the Quran. Same with the Gospel of Thomas. When we look at the Gospel of Thomas, I don't know if anything that it says that God shall not be a man. But that's not the reason it's not included. The reason it was not included in the canon is because it's late, it's spurious, it's Gnostic. It's not even Christian. These books, according to Lee MacDonald, that Adnan is quoting as these Gospels were all around, these Gospels were scattered all around, and we just chose the four. No scholar in academia, including Ehrman, including Metzger, will give any of those books a date beyond the second, uh, or, uh, earlier than beyond the second century. Meaning that these books were already written long past the original Gospels. Interesting fact. Every single one of those books lean on the Gospels to give themselves credibility. We know that they were written by people we do not know either. But Adnan is fending for them. He says that if you don't know the author, you should not believe in them. Yet he calls for those books to believe then, to be believed in. I don't see an equal scale. I don't see fairness when it comes to the Gospels. Just a short, short. Okay. Again, Rudolf is saying that God will preserve his word. We agree, God will preserve his word. Uh, no, no, there is a but. But people writing in the name of God, that word is not God's. So God doesn't have to preserve a gospel written by a individual, a, an individual somewhere in the middle of nowhere as God's word. So be, just because you decided to believe in four gospels uh, doesn't mean that they were actually sent by God. Okay, It's you imposing that view that they are inspired. Who are you to decide today? Or who are these church fathers to decide that this is inspired and this is not inspired? And scholars, the ones you have been mentioning, had worked on the criteria they used and we have dismantled some of those criteria in front of everyone today. That those criteria, they don't stand the test of scrutiny. None of them stands. Because when we, I mean, even right now as we speak of the can canonical gospels, there are parts of the Bible the Christian scholars today will tell you they were not written by the authors. Perocope adultery, the story of the adulteress in the Gospel of John. It was not written by John. It is unanimously admitted now by all Christian scholars who are serious scholars that that part was not written by John. Who wrote it? It is clearly a corruption into the text which was made later on into the text. So if someone can come and add into the word of God in the 6th or 7th or 8th century, now, because it wasn't taken out, you're going to now insist that, oh, God inspired someone to add it and it remains in there because God is choosing for it to, be, to, to remain in there even though it wasn't written by the author we attribute, to, uh, attribute that information to. Thank you. I think we need to take a question. Thanks so much. I just need to say again once more what I hear is that God cannot preserve his word. Again, we do not lean upon any of the authors that I've mentioned tonight to establish the authority of the Bible. That was not my case. I didn't mention that Metzger and therefore Ehrman and therefore this scholar and that scholar, including my friend James White, says the Bible is true. Therefore, the Bible is true. My contention was that the church very early on recognized what God has said because he did speak authoritatively in that community. And the people could recognize that which was spoken and affirm that which they've seen and heard from Jesus himself. That was the argument. That is the argument that's sustained by the Quran. That's the argument that is foretold in both the Old and New Testament scriptures. And that's the argument I will stick with. All right, thank you. All right, my question is for Ustad Adnan Rashid. Thank you uh, for a very spirited debate up to now. Um, my name is Monker Jacobs, and uh, my question has to do with Surah 5, uh, 47 to 49. Uh, I just got to thinking when you mentioned earlier that the word in Jil there is uh, singular. 
Um, the, the Arabic word for Torah, and I, I don't know what it is. I mean, the Torah is a collection of books. Um, the Arabic word that is being used there, is, is, is that a singular or is it a, a composite word? Because if it is, then, then, I would, then I would like to suggest that the Injil that is referred to there may well then be also uh, a singular word for a composite set of books. Very, very good question. Thank uh, you. Injil and the Torah are not Arabic words. They are not Arabic words. Injil is a Greek word and Torah is a Hebrew word. So Injil is the concept. Okay, Injil is the conce concept that came with Jesus Christ. Whatever he received and taught is Injil. As far as the Quran is concerned, what Jesus received from God and delivered is Injil, right? Those original words, not what Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John had written later on, okay? Because there are, there are clearly corruptions in those Gospels, as I mentioned earlier, one of them. Now, Torah, again, doesn't mean Pentateuch, the five first books of the Bible. Torah doesn't mean that. Torah means the law, the law of Moses, okay? The original one, not the one we found in these five books of Moses. Yes, are there ideas in these five books attributed to Moses? Uh, do we find any divine information in there? Do we have the truth there? Absolutely. There are parts of these five books we confirm as Muslims that they definitely came from God because they are directly in line with the Quran, what the Quran is telling us. So our criteria, we're very consistent. Our criteria to judge what actually came from God originally is the Quran because we can ascertain the Quran to be from God. We have a different standard. We have a different system altogether. We know Quran as we know it today. Every single word of it came from the Prophet's mouth. And the Prophet was receiving revelation. His scribes wrote it in front of him. And then it was put together by his early companions such as Abu Bakr and later on Uthman through a committee. So that's a completely different story how the Quran came together. So that's the answer to your question. All right. We, 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 could, we could have this debate going to midnight tonight, so let's be careful. Uh, you want to respond? Just 30 seconds. I just want to say that was my whole point when I spoke of the canon. We see a natural progression from the teaching, which is the singular canon of Scripture, the Injil, we can see it quite clearly. And that becomes ultimately the gospel, the Evangelion, and that ultimately gets translated and penned down in four gospels, which the New Testament witnesses by. That's actually the quote I gave from Graham Stanton. That's exactly what he has said. When you look at Justin Martin, the first century, you can see that there is a change from the word where it's used about the teaching of Jesus, but now it's become a word about the books of Jesus or the gospel of Jesus, which is the message. And the only four books that we know is the four books that we have in the New Testament. Thanks. All right. We, I'll take two more questions after this one here, please. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Assalamu alaikum. Peace be upon you. Thanks for the opportunity. My name is Sam Ahjad. Uh, my question to the pastor, uh, you, both of you spoke about the criteria. And uh, I think the Quran mentioned the criteria is that, or part of the criteria is that there shouldn't be any contradictions or discrepancies. And uh, we find, or the question is, how can the New Testament be uh, divine when it contradicts the Old Testament all over the map on so many principles and even the concept of God himself? For example, you find the New Testament uh, scholars talking about the Trinity, and you don't find any of the prophets of the Old Testament mention the Trinity or speak about it or explain it. Moses never spoke about it. Abraham never spoke about it. David never spoke about it. How come such an important concept like that wasn't preached in the Old Testament, and you say that, or you claim that it is, it is preached in the New Testament? Then you find Jesus, peace be upon him, for example, as a second example, uh, speaking about loving your enemies, and then when you come to the Old Testament, you find God, in brackets, Jesus, according to your belief, uh, saying that in numbers, uh, kill all the infant children and everyone, wipe away everyone, including the infant children. So should you love your enemy or should you uh, kill the, the, the enemies of your, of your or the, the infant children of your enemies? So the whole concept of God is modified in between both the New Testament and the Old Testament. Thank, Thank you. you. Maybe we can have the next discussion on the concept of God uh, in both uh, the Judeo-Christian scriptures and also in the Quran. Uh, that's a topic of my research. It's actually what I'm doing. It's actually what I'm writing my thesis on. 
That being said, we do believe in, uh, in the revelation of God from the Old to the New Testament that there's some form of progression, there's some form of fulfillment and adaption, and it does not necessarily mean that there's a change. It simply means that God has actually reestablished and uh, replaced uh, certain things which was uh, vindicated or given in the Old Testament. Let me give you an example of that. Uh, in Jeremiah chapter 31, verse 31 and 32, there's foretold that there will be a new book that will come. God actually speaks to the Old Testament prophet, and he tells him that there will be a day where the canon of the law is written on the hearts of man, uh, and that he will bring forth a new revelation. Well, we see it fulfilled, obviously, uh, and quite clearly mentioned in the New Testament. When it comes to the concept of God in the Old and New Testament, that is such a deep and interesting topic of discussion. Uh, I would maintain the following. Yes, the, the doctrine of the Trinity is definitely not explicitly stipulated in the Old Testament, neither in the New Testament. But we can see the rudiments of Scripture. We can see, for instance, in the Old Testament that there's a general interplay with the text that shows a clear plurality when it comes to God in the Old Testament and how He's revealed, obviously, in the New Testament. The metrics of that we can lay out and we can discuss, and that's why we have discussions and debates. And if you want any more information on that, you're welcome uh, to email me, and I can send you some of the detail on that. But let me tell you something. We can see a continuity. Christians don't just turn a blind eye to the Old Testament and say, oh, you know, the doctrine of the Trinity is not evident, and therefore, you know, we've got a problem. No, we look at scriptures like Isaiah 48, 16, which clearly denounces and clearly shows us Genesis chapter 1, Genesis chapter 9, 8. We can see that there's a dyadic pattern. We can see that there's a plurality that is evident in the Old Testament. But the New Testament tells us that it's only in the New Testament that the one that was in the bosom of the Father fully revealed the Father. And Jesus says, you can only really know God if you know him. Now, the question is, if we have Jesus wrong, we will have God wrong. And the point is of contention in the New Testament is very clear. If you get Jesus wrong, you will never know this God. And that's why Jesus said that they might only know. Muslims love this verse, John 17, verse 3. May you know the only true God. But the consequence of that is Jesus says immediately after that, and the one whom you have sent. Yet we are told that that Jesus is corrupted. We cannot know him. He's, he's, he's unknown. He's marred. So Muslims are actually saying, we cannot know that God, but we can only know him in the Quran. How convenient. The Mormons say the same thing. All right. We, we, uh, I'm, I'm going to finish off at quarter past four sharp. So what, if, n the number of questions uh, that we're going to take, that's it. Eh? Otherwise, we're going to... So coming back to the question uh, Sheikh asked there, right, um, that Trinity basically is, co is in contradiction with the Old Testament, and actually Christian scholars agree with that. You, you attempted there to show that Trinity does somehow implicitly, not explicitly, implicitly exist in the Old Testament, while one of your biggest scholars in the world, uh, William Lane Craig, categorically stated that the Trinity cannot be found anywhere in the Old Testament in particular. So... Can we find it in the, in the New Testament? Christian scholars, even about the New Testament, claim that it is implicit. It's not in, uh, those who claim it is there, they say it's implicit. It's not explicit. Now, one of the verses that was added into the, the, the Gospels, or sorry, the New Testament, uh, one, uh, 1 John 5, 7, right? Uh, one of the corruptions. Uh, my question to Rudolph is, when, was, when did God decide that it should remain in the Scripture for centuries? And when did God decide that it should be thrown out of the scriptures centuries later? So what games is God playing with all those Christians who were reading it as the word of God for five, six, seven hundred years? So why is God playing these games with the Christians? At one point, a verse is added into the scripture and those guys who were reading it for five, six hundred years, they were reading it as the word of God and God doesn't do anything. God doesn't send down angels or send down some church father to go and remove it, right? But then later on, uh, we discover that no manuscripts actually testify to it, and it's a corruption. Then it was thrown out. I'm sure. Yo, do you have a Bible there? Is that verse there? 1 John 5, 1 John 5, 7 is there. You have it. No, is it in the apparatus or is it in the main text? It's not in the main text. So, 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 yeah. Can you please answer why did God decide to throw it out and put it in? Uh, and again, Christians put it in their Bible so that Muslims can see it and not believe that the doctrine of the Trinity exists. We are quite open about it, but let me give you an example of how we deduce doctrine. If you look at the rest of the book, every single person in the triune God is mentioned in the book. 
The Holy Spirit is mentioned. Jesus is explicitly mentioned in chapter 5 as being God. The Father is mentioned, yet you're looking at one verse. Christians knew from the very onslaught in the very beginning that that uh, little phrase that was added in the text that was used from the manuscript tradition was an addition. Christians, the Alans, in actual fact, makes this emphatic in their works that the Christians were the ones that said that should not be there. You know why? Because we've got a critical edition of the New Testament that tells us what should be there and what should be in the manuscript. That's why we are not embarrassed by it. So nothing is added. We know exactly. We know exactly what should be there, and that's why we put it in the little preface. All right, we'll, we'll take a question. The gentleman here. Bismillah ar-Rahman rahim My name is Abdul Rauf Bax. I say the following with the utmost respect, humility, and integrity, especially to our Christian brethren who are here with us today. Um, I think, Mr. Moderator, I want to tackle the subject of this debate in another way. It seems, and I say with respect again to my Christian brethren, it seems the reason why we are having this debate of here today is because maybe the Christian religion is at a standstill and they have not yet or yet to recognize the final prophet and the final revelation. The, 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 the Bible recognizes previous prophets like Solomon and David, etc., etc. But they have not yet, or they're not, I don't know what's the reason, but maybe Ustad can maybe remind us and advise us as to the reason as to why Christianity mm. has not recognized Muhammad as the final prophet and the Quran as the final revelation. Okay. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Can we take one more question and perhaps uh, the, the one at the back, those two gentlemen, one, can we have one of the two of you ask a question, please? And then... I'll take the uh, middle one. And uh, just, just one of the two of you and then that gentleman at the back. Uh, with a creamish uh, top. Keep your questions nice and short, please. Amir Adams from UWC. I would just like to ask, basically, if the changes which was made, the reference to now by Ustad Adnan and the respected pastor, if those changes were God-destined, meaning that the revised standard versions and all the versions that came about, if that was destined by God and God Almighty inspired, the doctors of divinity, and as we would say in Cape Town, the Khruat Basa of Christianity, if they were inspired to make those changes and revisions, and also for the pastor Rudolf, which canon specifically is his favorite or the most authentic according to him. Thank you. Thank you very Thank much. You. Thank you. The young man with the, with the cream top. The last question. Last question. Assalamu alaikum. Alaikum. Uh, good question to pastor. Your name, please. My name is Musa. I uh, got a question to Pastor. A Bible say to uh, uh, Exodus 4, verse 4. A Bible say, As you, all us, we know that God is a creator of heaven and earth. And the Bible says that the um, devil is a God of this earth. So I want to know who, uh, who did God expire to say that word, that the devil is a God of this universe. All right, those are, those are the three last questions, uh, Pastor. I hope I remember everything. Let me start with the last one. When you look at 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 4, in the translation of the devil being the God of this world, the context renders it quite clearly that certain individuals were called G-O-D, little God, mockingly, even in the Old Testament, to depict somebody that has authority. People that had authority were known as Elohim, for instance, in the Old Testament and in the New Testament, the same phraseology is picked up by Paul, showing that these individuals that were walking on the earth, these individuals that placed themselves in authority, including Iblis, tries to be a little God, but they're not. There's only one true God. Uh, the, to the second question as to what uh, reading of the New Testament is in actual fact my favorite, I would say the following. There is a clear difference between what is known as uh, the versions of the Bible, and sometimes I get this idea in my mind that Muslim things, versions mean that the texts look all different. It doesn't. Uh, in actual fact, when you look at the text quite clearly, in all of the translations, when we speak of versions, we basically speak of translations. All of them always come to the same conclusion. None of them read differently. 
and all of them are pretty adequate to describe to you exactly what happens in a context. I work in a seminarial context. I work with students. When I tell them to deal with the critical text itself, I will deal with the Nestle Alan 29, but even if I don't deal with that and the students don't know Greek, I would always tell them to consult more than one translation. And there are lexicons, there are um, textbooks, there are uh, dictionaries, there are Bible dictionaries that can aid you and help you to understand the word. In actual fact, there's websites uh, that actually helps you with the actual reading of the text. If you do a study of that, I can guarantee you there's no confusion as to what is in the New Testament, even though there are different translations. So I will, I will read majority of them. Currently, I, I'm actually, I received the gift. Uh, I'm in the ESV, used to read the H, uh, HCSB translation. It's an English translation, used to read the NIV, used to read the New King James Version. When I study a text, I still go to all of those to see what scholars have said uh, and what emerged out of the text. So no, no, no problem with that. I hope I helped. Sorry, I didn't hear the second question. Can I repeat? Sorry, I forgot. was basically the first part of the question, and that was the changes basically in the scripture. For example, there are many who start, Adnan also mentioned some of them, for example, John 3.16, the famous verse on the Trinity and so forth, that was thrown out and the revisions. Was that godly inspired to all the generations of doctors of divinity and all the Christian scholars? Was that God inspired for them to take that out? Or was it just on their own account that they made those changes? Okay. Like for instance, he mentioned between John 7 and 8, the Pericope Adultery, which uh, in actual fact in the earlier manuscripts, uh, it, they, are found, they found the story in Luke and then it's found in John and it's placed there. Uh, I've got a very peculiar understanding of the Pericope Adultery and when I read it in actual fact, I recognize that because it's there, it has to be inspired because God willed for it to be there. So I will not challenge God as to what God in the end allowed to be in the text. I know a lot of uh, scholars will say they don't see that it's inspired. Uh, there's nothing in the context of the story uh, that is in actual fact pertaining to doctrine. So it does not change the doctrine of the church if you believe it should be there or not. But what I will say is, is when you read that story, it gives life to the way in which Jesus lived and what he did and how he esteemed women, which, which, is, which is pretty, pretty good. The, the last question was the one uh, where uh, the question asked whether uh, Muhammad, why Christians do not accept Muhammad as a prophet? Okay. Well, uh, purely because of the finality of Christ. Jesus Christ comes upon the scene. Hebrews chapter 11 verse 1 says, in times past, I read it tonight, God spoke through various means and various ways, but in the last day, that's a finality. He has spoken. Uh, that means it's close. It's to an end through the person of Jesus Christ. Uh, I've actually written a whole blog article uh, on my blog that explains why Christians cannot accept the prophet Muhammad. And it's not, uh, and maybe we can one day have a conversation on the Prophet Muhammad. I think I'll surprise you guys. I've got a lot of appreciation for certain things, uh, which might surprise you again, because what you hear in the media is sometimes very uh, weird. But here's the thing, though. Christians are not uh, uh, in any way or form allowed to accept what is given by Muhammad as a revelation because of that which is written in the New Testament. The problem, though, is, and that what I raised tonight is, if the Quran calls for Christians to follow the guidance of the New Testament, then the Quran is in trouble. The author of the Quran says we must turn to the Bible, but when we turn to the Bible, the Bible in actual fact tells us that the Quran is not succinct with its message, and therefore we reject it. But uh, um, maybe afterwards I can give you the article and the details of that. I go into great detail with that. I don't want to take any more time. All right, just a quick response. Okay, thank you for that question you asked. Um, Christians do to Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam what Jews did to Jesus. Same thing, same excuse. The Jews said he's an imposter, he's not a true prophet of Israel, and the law of Moses is final for us. We don't need another prophet to come and bring another idea for us. So the Jews use those conceptions to reject Jesus Christ. Just like that, Christians today deliberately uh, reject Prophet Muhammad, even though there are so many reasons to believe in him, biblically speaking, there are prophecies about him. In fact, when Rudolf says that this is the finality of Jesus, it is the finality of Jesus which causes them to reject Muhammad, but Jesus himself said in the Gospel of John that I have many things to tell you, but there will be another one coming after me who will tell you 
uh, all, all what remains to be told, right? This is clearly stated in the Gospel of John. It's there. If Jesus, if his message is final, then why do we need another person to come and tell, uh, come and tell us other things? On top of that, the Jewish people, the Jewish people were expecting three personalities to arrive. Okay, this is all again from the Gospel of John. When they went and questioned uh, John the Baptist, they asked him three questions. Who are you? Are you Elijah? Are you the Messiah? Or are you that prophet? Are you that prophet? So, John was the, the Elijah. He was Elijah. Messiah was Jesus Christ. Who is that prophet? Who is still yet to come? even after the Messiah has arrived. Okay, so they were expecting these three personalities to come. And John does not contradict these three questions. He doesn't say uh, that, hold on a second, which prophet are you talking about? There's no prophet expected. What prophet? It was a well-established fact among the Jewish people at that time that a prophet foretold in Deuteronomy 18.18 18 is to come. Because the reference is to Deuteronomy 18.18, 18, where the Jews asked that question from John the Baptist, are you that prophet? And he said, I'm not that prophet, okay? I'm not the Messiah. So it is very clear that Rudolf has misunderstood the concept uh, of the message of Jesus Christ. And, and we don't have to accept that, uh, you know, notion of his finality because, again, he himself is saying that I have things to tell, but I can't, I can't say those things now. Someone else will come after me and will tell you those things. Christians claim that's the Holy Spirit. We claim... That's not the Holy Spirit because the Holy Spirit was already there. The Holy Spirit was already there, right? Uh, it is someone else. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. I think we've kind of exhausted all questions for now. Uh, I'm sure there would have been many more. Just, just before you go, people, just closing comments from five minutes on, on, on with uh, Ustad Adnan and five minutes from Pastor Rudolf. Five minutes each. Bismillah rahman rahim Ladies and gentlemen, thank you so much for attending the debate. And this was a debate conducted in spirit of love, compassion, and mercy for each other. We have a lot of respect for each other. So please do not take the debate in the wrong way. Don't think that the debate was designed or intended to hurt someone's feelings. That's not the intention. The intention is to express ideas, to share views, so that we can open... Uh, you know, doors of uh, ideas in people's minds. So this was the purpose of this debate. Finally, I would like to thank my dear friend Rudolf for taking time to come all the way to uh, Cape Town to indulge in this discussion. I really appreciate his input. Um, I do not agree with a lot of things he said, but this is the beauty of debate, right? Uh, you don't have to agree on everything. Coming back to the topic, I think um, those who are listening and those who are watching, it is quite clear that main questions I asked remain unanswered. Who were the people who chose these books to be included into the canon? What ideas were they using to choose these books? Who decided that these ideas are from God? Does God have anything to do with it? Does Jesus have anything to do with it? Do his disciples have anything to do with it? Did they want a New Testament? Just like we have in Islam, the prophet told us what the Qur'an is. The Qur'an itself introduces itself as the word of God, right? Nowhere in the New Testament we are told that this book was intended to be from God or it is a revelation from God, okay? Just like we have in the Qur'an, clear verses that this book is a revelation from God, okay? We don't have anything like that in the New Testament. So it's clear that the New Testament was put together by individuals who thought that these books represent the original message of Jesus, Jesus Christ as they saw it, right? And Rudolf has been saying that this was a process used by God to choose the word of God. And then we question that process. Why was it that books were added in to this canon and thrown out? Uh, and then even after the canon was chosen, information was interpolated. It was added in and it remained in there for centuries. So as far as those Christians were concerned, they were reading these stories 
attributed to the authors and the authors never wrote them. Examples are the Gospel of John, the story of adulteress, um, and then first epistle of John, chapter 5, verse 7, and the Gospel of Mark, the ending of the Gospel of Mark. Most Christian scholars, conservative Christian scholars, are unanimous that these verses were not actually written by Mark. Then why were these additions made? Is this God doing? Is this the doing of God? God is playing these games that, okay, put some, put some verses in, put some stuff in, and then take, take them out later on in the 20th century. Amazingly, these verses I mentioned were not questioned for the first 1,900 years of Christianity. Rudolf is nodding. He's agreeing with me. Christians were reading Parakope Adultery, the story of the adulteress, and the ending of the Gospel of Mark, and 1 John 5, 7 as the Word of God. Why did God deceive Christians, using your standard, that He is the one who guides the process? Why did God guide the process for these editions, and they remained in your canon for 1,900 years, if you claim that, that's what the case is, because that's not the case, because these editions were made much later, after the 4th century, in some cases, Right? Why did God allow all of this to take place? If God, if God himself is guiding the process and suddenly Christians woke up looking at the manuscripts that, hold on a second, this information never came from the authors, let alone God, so it needs to be taken out. And now many Bibles put this information into the footnote that this is not part of the Bible, this is not part of what the authors actually wrote. So there is a lot uh, happening in the first three century, centuries, Right? So ladies and gentlemen, the canon of the New Testament, therefore, is not divine. It is man-made. Men came together in the first 300 years of Christianity and the 4th and the 5th and the 6th. Up to the 16th century, the debate was still going on. To this day, the church is not unanimous on the canon. Ethiopian canon has the four Gospels, the Acts, the seven Catholic epistles, the 14 epistles of Paul, the book of Revelation, then Synodos, four sections, Clement, the book of the covenant, the Didache, sorry, not Didache, the, 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 uh, the Discali, right? Thank you, Adnan, your and five final, minutes. final point. Uh, and the Syrian Orthodox Church, their canon is also different. So why are Christians to this day following different canons, different lists of the word of God or the revelation of God? You see, is still not decided. It's still an open question. The answer is, it is man-made. God has nothing to do with choosing these Thank books you. and reading them as the Word of God. Thank you so much. Thank you, Pastor Dito. Thank you. Well, uh, thank you so much for you guys sitting there listening, asking questions. It's always such a pleasure to come to Cape Town, and I always love the Cape Townian uh, Muslim community. I really do. Uh, the question tonight was, is the New Testament man-made or divine? Uh, every single time we heard that it, it's not divine, what was used to legitimize the fact that it was not divine is that other people said it was not divine. My argument, in fact, showed quite clearly that God says that His words is divine. And God lays out exactly what should be accepted as being authoritative. Uh, and, you know, by the way, in the end, we should make ending statements, not new arguments. Naughty, naughty. <laughs> but here's the thing, though. When we look at the text of the New Testament, I've shown quite emphatically and clearly, it's been announced tonight, Adnan did not say anything negative about the fact that the Quran even mentions and speaks quite highly and positively, of the New Testament text. Uh, and we can see quite clearly that in the canon of Scripture itself, the canon of Scripture makes it absolutely clear. The same as the Quran, the same as when we look at Surah 6, uh, when we look at Surah 6 and showing that, that Allah promises that He'll preserve His Word. The same promise is found in the Old Testament and in the New Testament. Why should we only choose the Quran if God speaks succinctly and clearly, and if God gives a clear credence as to what we should believe? That also being said, we can see quite clearly that the New Testament authors, their understanding was that they took the message that Christ gave them. Remember, I mentioned in John 14, 26, that Jesus speaks to his actual disciples. And he says to them, uh, guess what? When I go away, what will happen? 
I will send to you the Holy Spirit, and he will put into remembrance to you what I've said to his actual disciples. But that was not Muhammad. He's speaking to the actual disciples, and he's telling them that what he said to them will be preserved. Uh, in Mark 13, I showed you quite clearly, verse 31, it says quite clearly, Jesus speaking, heaven and earth shall pass away, but my words will remain. The arguments that we heard tonight is quite clear. It's stating that Jesus lied. Well, in fact, it says that Jesus lied there, and therefore, you know what? Uh, we're not going to accept it, that he said it because he said that, and it doesn't fit the Quran. I don't know about you, but I want to know for sure that when God speaks, God assures us that what he says is true, and it is preserved. And that is what we find in the Quran, the New Testament, and in the Old Testament. When we look at the first Christian fathers, their understanding of this emergence of the New Testament, I repeat it often, it's not them that chose the books. They merely recognize the books which God has put in place. So therefore, the product of the New Testament canon and the 27 book New Testament canon in itself is a product of God. God laid it out by his own authority. And Adnan made the right statement. He said, it sounds very circular. I know it does. But it also sounds circular when you say the Quran says that the Quran is the word of God. He uses the same argument. But we all have a worldview that we come from. And the worldview I started with tonight was this. We believe that God has spoken. All of us. But we believe that God can preserve his word. And therefore, I'm going to go with what God said. And when I read what Jesus said about himself, when I read what the Quran says favorably about the New Testament, I'm going to believe what it says. And it says that it's favorable, it's trustworthy, and it is true. I want to ask you a question. If you study history and you look at the, the difference between Tarif al-Manan and Tarif al-Nas, and the way in which Muslims believed historically the Bible has changed, why in the first earlier dispensations of the Muslim era? It's unanimous. They believe that, that the Jews, in actual fact, when you look at Surah Al-Ma'idah, chapter 5, the commentary there always is that they changed something in the text. They hid it away from the prophet by putting their hands on it and hiding it from the prophet. It was never what we hear tonight, takes us out of the Bible and, and things being abrogated. Nowhere in the world... Will a Christian agree with the fact that God's word can simply be changed? We believe God kept it in check. Even Muhammad, when he refers to the Injil and the Zabur, and when he refers to the Torah and Injil in his day, we know what it looked like because we've got manuscripts that date to that day in the 5th century and the 6th century. So what can we say about the word of God? Well, first of all, I believe that what God has said is preserved, and it is God's word because God said so. Uh, all of these different Bibles that is mentioned, show me a church that's got varied beliefs. All of us believe the same thing. All of the Orthodox Church globally believe in the same doctrines. Do we have different nuances about it? Are there certain heretical groups? Yes, there are. But there are also sects in Islam. There are also varied beliefs. And the Muslims, should we dispel Orthodoxy in the Quran because of it? No, that's not an argument. God has spoken and therefore, we can believe what God said. Thank I'm you, Pastor. You Your five minutes. Uh, thank you very Thanks. much. Can I thank each and every one of you for having come out this uh, evening? It was, I think, a stimulating debate. I must thank, um, besides uh, the audience, the speakers, both Pastor uh, Rudolf and uh, Ustad Adnan, uh, for spending time with us. I think it was a stimulating. Stimul He's thanking um, uh, Ustad for the coin and the book. Uh, I think it's a fantastic gesture. Uh, I must thank um, Nazir Parker for, for hosting Adnan uh, 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 over this period. I must thank Dr. Elias Parker. He arranged almost everything uh, that you have had here today. Thank you very much. Next time.